It took me a while, but I finally found it. I had to go into the depths of the Mariana trenches of the interwebs, the deep web if you will, to find this game you guys told me about. I don't know what kind of weird shit you're into. You guys are weird! But hey, I'm respectful of your wishes and the stuff you want me to review. Massage creep? Naughty America? Girl angels? Asian angels? Seduced by a cougar? So without further ado, here it is. The review for Black Geyser. It's Black Geyser, you idiot. Black Geyser is the name of the game. Not Black Geyser. Oh shit. Oh, okay. Just, just give me a minute. One month later. Okay, so I finally finished Black Geyser. I did it all, from beginning to end. Oh, you poor dear. That would be really, really boring. You have no idea, Liliana. Welcome to Yold Entertainment, my name is Alex, and as you know, it is my duty, my mission, my purpose in life to help you decide whether that game that you have been thumbing for so long is indeed the right game for you or not. And today we have Black Geyser Couriers of Darkness. Commenter Darko had this to say in the comment section. There is a new CRPG, Black Geyser Couriers of Darkness, which captures the essence of Baldur's Gate. To say that the spirit of Baldur's Gate lives on through Black Geyser would be a little bit like saying that the Lord of the Rings is alive and kicking, thanks to Amazon's Ring of Power. <laughs> Serious? Besides, who names his game Couriers of Darkness? Sounds like an evil version of UPS. A more evil version, that is. The thing is that some of you apparently like this game, and yet many others seem to hate it. This time I'm not even going to pretend that I think the truth may lie somewhere in between. It doesn't. Black Geyser is bad. There is no candy coating it. So let's break it down. And I'm talking break. Character creation and character progression are up first. This may very well be the best thing about Black Geyser. You can choose from an assortment of pre-made characters or you can create your own. The first thing you choose at the time of your character's creation is your race. This is interesting because your eligible classes depend on your race, and I think that's one way to make your race matter in the game. And of course, there are humans, elves, dwarves, because what would a medieval fantasy game be without these races, right? You also have the Rillo and the Feldegog, which are Black Geyser's specific races, if you could call them that. Your race is also mentioned a couple of times or three during the game, and I did get a bit of a sense of ethnicity from the world in Black Geyser. Helgengar is one of the first characters you meet in the game, and his reason for being out there adventuring is somewhat related to the fact that he is a dwarf. And you do get a bit of insight on dwarven culture by talking to him. Elves live in forests, isolated from the rest of the world, and they are suspicious of outsiders and resentful for the things that people from other races have done to them. Then there are the Rillo, who look and feel as though they were modeled after our own ancient Middle Eastern cultures. And these are all things that add to the immersion of the game, as little as that is, but it makes that initial choice of race matter at least a little. Then there are classes in Black Geyser, and though they aren't presented as such, you could say that they more or less stick to a two-tier category system, not unlike the one you have in D&D and Pathfinder games. You have some warrior-type classes like Templars, Fighters, Highlander, and Rangers. Outlaws, which are a bit like rogues and are divided into thieves and swindlers, priest-type classes like clerics, druids, and shamans, and wizard-type characters like necromancers, winter mages, spellweavers, and convokers, which of course specialize in damage magic. There's also multi-classing in Black Geyser. After you choose your class, you can choose the option of add more to add an additional class. But this is of course optional. The additional classes available depend on the first class you choose, which means this second class has to be compatible with the first one, so to speak. Then you can choose to allocate some attribute points, or you can let the game make this decision for you by clicking on Allocate. You can also choose to allocate points to resistances here, but only if you put a few points into the supernatural attribute. Then there are skills and spells. Skills are divided in general skills and specific skills, and these are quite interesting in Black Geyser because there are quite a few opportunities in the game for you to make good use of these skills. I chose to cultivate bargaining and persuasion, and I feel like that was an excellent choice as most of the time the options that opened up because I had that skill were indeed preferable to combat or to the other dialogue options available. Combat skills and spells also become interesting at some point in the game. Unfortunately, this point comes very, very late in the game. Even in the highest difficulty level, every combat encounter in this game can be resolved through some variation of the good old tank and spank formula. It's just too damn easy. Combat only gets challenging and interesting in the final third of the game, and again, only in the highest difficulty level. 
and take it from someone who doesn't particularly excel at these types of games. Fighters do have a taunt skill, and man, it was refreshing to have this skill at your disposal. It felt like ages since the last time I played a warrior type with a proper skill to funnel damage onto itself. The drying and brewing skill, for example, allows you to craft potions, and if you play in the highest difficulty, this will become important, and in turn, it will make exploration and resource gathering also important. There are also weapon proficiencies, and I feel like my personal policy when it comes to weapon proficiencies paid immensely in Black Geyser. I always choose to focus on one particular type of weapon. Typically, I'm a Warhammer wielding dwarf. And I think this approach paid far better dividends than it usually does in these games. And there are of course a few options for you to further customize your character, like portraits, hairstyles, skin color, voices, and some other superficial shit. These traits have never been too important to me, but I didn't like any of the portraits or voices available. As you level through the game, you'll get the chance to improve all of these skills. Wizard-type characters will be able to learn new spells when they level, and as it happens in D&D games, they'll also be able to add spells to their spell books from the many magic scrolls they will be collecting throughout the journey. Warrior and Outlaw types will get the chance to gain additional uses of skills they already know, and Cleric-type characters will learn their spells automatically, although it is up to you to assign them to available empty slots in your spell book as they level. This is all fine and dandy, but unfortunately, with very little effort and a modicum of common sense, you'll always be two or three steps ahead of every challenge the game throws at you. You'll be meeting companions in this game, and if your IQ is above room temperature, you'll probably have the good sense to spread skills evenly amongst them so that you have an expert on everything. And although this adds further gameplay value to your companions, it also means you'll be cruising through every passage of the game, thus losing a great deal of potential opportunity cost interest. In my experience, only outlaw-specific talents involve any relevant opportunity cost. There's hide and sneak, steal and plant item, lock picking, shady dealing, and disarm traps. And there are important parts of the game in which being proficient at these skills will go a long way, but you won't be able to max out all of them unless you have two rogues. This may be true of other class-specific skills, but it didn't feel like it in my experience. Also, combat is so easy for such a large chunk of the game that I feel like I could have attained almost the exact same result, using the exact same tactics, namely tank and spank, even if I had built my party in a much different way. Gameplay. Gameplay in Black Geyser is... Uh, revolves around combat, exploration, and questing. Let's start with combat. To be honest, I'm having a hard time trying to remember a game with more forgettable combat than the one in Black Geyser. Again, two-thirds of the game can be resolved 100% through tanking and spanking, even in the highest difficulty levels. And that's not too bad when you're just exploring an area in the game and beating the crap out of anyone who stands in your way. But a problem this game has is that every freaking time you travel between locations on your map, you'll be waylaid by a group of enemies and must defend yourself. These random combat encounters are a non-challenge. Seriously, there is no way to fuck this up. Even if the game completely ignores your formation and put those companions you've supposedly placed on the back lines at the very front. Every time. But the problem is not that these combat encounters are easy or that the game ignores your party formations. No, the problem is that you'll have to suck up a ridiculously long loading screen before each of these random combat encounters start. And yet another one before you reach your destination. And know that these loading screens are a lot longer than you're used to. If you think the first Pillars of Eternity game had long loading screens, you know nothing, Jon Snow. Black Geyser has party perks, which are bonuses that you acquire as your party levels. And yes, your party also levels as a group. And I don't know if it was because I had the guard rotation perk listed as my top cohesion perk or what, but resting was a complete joke in Black Geyser. Seriously, I wasn't ambushed a single time in the whole game while I was resting, and when shit got serious near the end of the game, I simply abused this mechanic as much as I needed to. In Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous, you had to pay special attention to the whole resting deal. It was a resource management thing even, because first, you could be ambushed while resting at any given time, and second, there was this abyssal corruption mechanic which prevented you from exploiting the camp function. And yeah, I agree with some of you that this particular mechanic was a little too punishing, but Black Geyser exemplifies to perfection the consequences of there not being any cost to resting. It cheapens combat, and it sucks all the gravitas out of the experience. I have to admit that in the final stretch of the game, which starts with this fight, combat finally gets good. 
Yes, there are some utterly boring tank and spank encounters like these blood golems or these warriory bosses, but there are also some very cool fights that require you to make interesting tactical decisions. You'll have to prioritize your targets carefully, choose your spells, move your characters around in a certain way, do some off tanking, time your spells, flank, in short, it finally gets fun is what I mean. Some of these late game combat encounters reminded me of some of the best fights in Baldur's Gate 2's expansion pack Throne of Ball. Some of you didn't seem to like the combat in that expansion pack, but I happen to think it's one of the few good things about it. And that final fight? Oh, you'll be reminded of that fight in Black Geyser at some point, believe me. So yes, this final stretch of the game reminded me of some of the best moments in Icewind Dale 2 or Throne of Ball, but man, I wish it hadn't taken so long to get there. Also, just a reminder here, play the damn thing in Courier, otherwise you'll be bored to tears with the combat in Black Geyser. Some people will be pleased to know that there's a fair bit of freedom and consequence in Black Geyser, and that is certainly meant as a throwback to some of the best games of old like Arcanum and Baldur's Gate 2. You can kill NPCs, steal, plant items, and there's a consequence to each of these actions. If your hide and sneak talent's good enough, you can silently plunder the entire city without anyone ever noticing, but if you get caught stealing more than once in the same location, you'll have to do battle with the entire room. If that's your thing, well, then you'll probably enjoy this game a little bit more than I did. But unfortunately, I don't think the developers anticipated every possible outcome that could come from the player's decisions. For example, during your first meeting with the king, there are a few things that you could do to get the king to attack you, and you may even kill the king and his guards, but that'll just cost the entire city to attack you. And even if you could survive this, which you can't, because there are creatures like golem guards that are a lot higher level than you are, the game's critical path remains the same, and therefore, you'd just be locking yourself out of progressing further in the game. There's also questing in Black Geyser, and there's generally more than one way to get these quests done, and the way in which you solve these missions even has an impact later on in the game. And that is always a good thing, but the game's critical path design is more akin to that of Icewind Dale 2 than, let's say, that in Baldur's Gate 2, Tyranny, or Arcanum. But that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. But the script in Black Geyser fails to generate the feeling of imminent world-ending danger. Yeah, yeah, the world as we know it is coming to an end because there is no stopping the evil that's coming and shit. We'll get to why that didn't work later, but for now I'll give you an example of a much simpler and much more efficient script. In Icewind Dale 2, you've not even started the game and your boat has already been attacked by a horde of invading goblins. You arrive on Targos and you immediately get a taste of what you're up against. Not long after that, you learn that waves of goblins and orcs have been relentlessly attacking the city. People have died, trade has come to a halt, and the prospect is grim. So after you're done fending off the latest wave of goblin invaders, which you will probably survive by the skin of your teeth because Icewind Dale 2 doesn't fuck around with its combat, you'll have to take the fight to the enemy. This invasion of the enemy's stronghold is motherfucking epic, by the way. During your invasion of the York's stronghold, a new piece of information is revealed. Turns out that these bad guys are but pawns of a much higher and much more powerful evil. So you return to the city of Targos with this new piece of information, which is enough for the ruling lord there to know where to send you to find more information about the evil powers behind the invasion. Your party immediately embarks upon a new adventure to find out who the real bad guys are. And because the only way to get there is flying, you board an unreliable flying contraption, helmed by an unreliable crazy ass gnome who's famous for crashing into things. So, as you're flying towards your new destination, some dudes who really don't want you to get there conjure up a storm and your journey's cut short as your sepaling crashes into a wall of ice and you black out. You wake up to the sound of monstrous beetles attacking the remains of your wrecked ship and you've no choice but to defend yourself. And this is just the first fourth of the game, friends. See what I mean? In Nicewind Dale 2, there's always something big at stake. Nothing ever goes as planned. There are points of no return every step of the way. There's unreliable flying contraptions, magical forests that you need to figure out, time traveling, infiltrating locations disguised as the bad guys, defending strongholds against overwhelming odds. The game is out there. That is what I mean. Black Geyser is just a pale imitation of all these games of old in this respect. These are some of the most exciting highlights in Black Geyser. Mind the minor spoilers if you even care about the story in this one. At some point in the story, you are sent on a diplomatic mission to put an end to a rebellion, in a place called Darun Gould. But your job is to escort the diplomatic envoy who's going to do the talking on the king's behalf. But while you're en route to Darun Gould, a band of crazy ass cultist ambushes your caravan and the envoy gets killed in the process. Which means you'll have to carry out the negotiations all by yourself. Ooh. Suspenseful. Thrilling, yes. 
I suppose the game expects you to become interested in these cultists. Who are they? What do they want? What's this pact they mention? I guess you're supposed to ask yourself these questions, but this episode does not change your agenda or your plan or what you have to do in any way. Nothing they say is useful or relevant to what you have to do at the time. Wouldn't it have been cooler if you had been ambushed and kidnapped by these guys, maybe lose the battle and pass out only to wake up in a cell somewhere unknown? Maybe you find a way to escape your captors and on your way out, you uncover a plot to assassinate the king. So you have to hurry back to warn the king or maybe bring this information to Daron Gould. I don't know man, give me something unexpected and game changing. Here's another highlight. At some point, you leave Daron Gould to find a cure to the terrible plague that's been crippling the city. So you go and find some help and when you come back, Turns out everyone in town's been turned into zombies, and you have to fight your way to the town's main building where you expect to find some answers. What you find out is that your evil brother has pulled a coup, thrown every noble into prison, and that it turns out that the plague has been caused by the evil inside him. Those are the highlights. Those are the most exciting moments, I shit you not, on a game that came out in the year 2022. It wouldn't even be so bad if it weren't for the dozens of unimportant and shamelessly generic fetch quests that this game has for you. I guess they had to justify the Courier of Darkness bit in the title. But man, they went overboard with a FedEx simulation in this one. Seriously, if you think questing was generic, boring, and fetch questy in the Temple of Elemental Evil, you know nothing, Jon Snow. But Alex, this game's called Careers of Darkness because Zip it, Gigi had did them. And then there's exploration. I suppose there are some locations that aren't mandatory in this game that are there for you to fetch quest at will. But there's nothing interesting about them in the least. There are no hidden areas, and there are no new locations, cool loot, hidden boss encounters, NPCs hidden away behind skill checks or anything. Nada. Dungeons are rather small, and its areas aren't interconnected in interesting ways, as they are in the Temple of Elemental Evil or Baldur's Gate 2. That gratifying feeling of adventure and discovery that you get in games like Pathfinder Kingmaker and Wrath of the Righteous or Divinity Original Sin 2 are completely absent here. As far as items go, there are some interesting items to be found by killing some of the toughest enemies in the game, and vendors do have a thing or two that might interest you. But when I say interesting, I'm using double air quotes. Forget about items with special talents or items that work in tandem in interesting ways like the ones you get in Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. There are named items in this game, but they are just marginally better than regular items, and that's just disappointing. The game uses a global mechanic of greed, and some people have called it interesting and innovative, but for the life of me, I can't see why. In Black Geyser, the world becomes greedier as you progress through the game and certain events take place. Your party can become greedier or more generous depending on your decisions. And as I understand it, it also adds to the global state of greediness in the world. But as far as I could tell, this had absolutely no palpable consequences in the world. And if it did, the game did a terrible job of informing me of what had transpired as a product of my good or greedy actions. I don't think any locations became available, I don't think any characters changed their mind about things, I don't feel anything changed because of my greedy or generous actions. Your party can also grow to be idolized or vilified, but this only felt like a meter to keep an eye on, rather than a relevant indication of anything. But maybe I was too much of a goody doer to notice any change. Go figure. Maybe someone evil played an entirely different game. Who knows? Gameplay in Black Geyser shines from time to time, but these moments are too few and too far in between, and it just takes too much time to get to that final stretch where things get good. Story and lore. I know I sometimes shit on games for being filled with tropes and cliches, I shit on games when the plot is pushed forward through plot convenient events and when the characters personalities and actions accommodate to whatever the plot needs from them. But hey, even in games that are guilty of most of these charges, there's something to like or to be invested in. So Lost the Crown of the Magister's story is hilariously bad, laughably so at times, but your adventurers have actual personalities and they feel like a cohesive party of friends whose friendship is endearing and delightfully humorous at times. Neverwinter Nights 2's story is formulaic, its characters are tropey and almost everything that happens story-wise is derivative of something better that we have read or played before in D&D books or games. But then you have passages like this. And you, Sand? Anything more you wish to add that you did not say in the first three hours? Only that the dress the ambassador is wearing is clearly out of fashion, a blatant attempt to distract the court from the matter at hand, and is more appropriate for a docked prostitute than a diplomatic envoy. Thank you. And like this. 
as if I'd want to stay in that prison with you high-nosed witches for another year. You're right. Here among the docks is where you belong, <laughs> peddling yourself for cheap coin. Wow! Someone give me a tankard! This is going to get good! It's not the beluga caviar of writing, it's more like a greasy cheeseburger that gets the job done. One that makes you say, fuck it, let's eat this shit and have fun with it. But the story in Black Geyser has the worst of everything the genre has to offer. Some of the most cringe-worthy tropes, convenient events that push forward the story, characters who wear their intentions and roles in the story like a badge, and a decided lack of humor. And unfortunately, the game does give it its best shot with some humorous dialogue options. And I couldn't help but compare this attempt at humor with the funny passages in the original Baldur's Gate, or Icewind Dale 2. That's when I said, He's a fucking tryhard. Don't even get me started on what the Black Geyser is or what it does. It's the most unimaginative bullshit that I have ever seen in a game. But it's kind of what the whole story is about, so I won't be spoiling it to you. Also, if a game has this motherfucker, there's a very good chance the story sucks. Who is this motherfucker, you ask? It goes by many names. She was called Malady in Divinity Original Sin 2, Alin Shear in Kingdoms of Amalur, and in Black Geyser she goes by the name of Isla. This is generally a dark-haired, overpowered chick, often magical, who knows a lot more than she's letting on. Because it's not important to the plot, we don't rightly know where she comes from. Because it is important to the plot, she has crucial information about the things we have to do and the places we need to go to. But because it's not important to the plot, we don't know how she came by this information. Because she's mysterious and shit. And of course, she will reveal this information in doses instead of all at once for no particular reason. And these doses of plot relevant information will be revealed when it is most convenient to do so. Why is a character such as this a symptom of bad writing? Because it's a convenient, low effort way to sidestep the uncomfortable writing task of engineering an adventure that takes the character through peril, loss, struggle, and sometimes victories. An adventure throughout which the characters piece together the true nature of the evil they are up against, learn about themselves and the ones around them, and overcome their flaws and obstacles to complete their hero's journey. But Alex, don't these characters you just mentioned count as the supernatural aid component of the hero's journey? Yeah, they would. If they didn't fuck up the road of trials, the approach, the ordeal, and the magic flight part of the journey. For further examples of proper implementation of the hero's journey, feel free to look up Mask of the Betrayer, Planescape Torment, or Disco Elysium. By the way, no, I didn't think the story in Divinity Original Sin 2 was all that bad, but Melody is the worst thing about it. And speaking of Mask of the Betrayer, this is a game that thrives on its masterful narrative, and one of the things it gets very right is the mystery aspect of the story. As the protagonist of the game, you don't rightly know what's going on in Mask of the Betrayer, but you are slowly becoming an abomination, and figuring out what's causing this and who's behind it may be the only way to prevent this gruesome fate. See, in Black Geyser, the events that trigger your personal adventure are only loosely connected to the greater evil that threatens to end the world as we know it. And even the notion that there is a greater evil that's threatening to end everything starts to get traction only very late in the game. Mild spoilers coming your way. So at the beginning of the game, you are some lowly pleb whose job is to serve drinks to the local lord, some chap who goes by the name Lord Espen, and his noble friends. You get the idea that these people are important politicians, and that there's some rebellion going on somewhere. But then everything goes tits up and the estate is invaded by the very rebels these nobles had just been talking about. Lord Espen is killed in the process, and his murderer turns out to be his own son, who happens to be one of the leaders of the rebellion. Amidst the confusion of the battle, you manage to escape in the nick of time. Actually, it's some old hag who saves you. And it so happens that this old crone knows a lot about the ruling lord that had just been murdered, and of you. What are the odds, huh? The hack reveals almost immediately that Lord Espen was your father. I've always loved how in these games in which you can choose your race, there's always some hilarious explanation that justifies the fact that you're not the same race as your father. But that's neither here nor there. Setting aside the fact that a writer who whips out the he's your father cliche in the year 2022 should really be pondering other job opportunities or sending his resume to Disney, this doesn't at all make a strong enough case for you to do anything. By this point in the story, it had never been hinted that this Lord Espen and you had any special kind of bond, beyond the fact that you, uh, uh, served the man his strings. 
So now you have to set out to claim what's yours by right of birth? And maybe find out who your brother really is and why he killed your father? How does that compare, for example, to the notion that there's some spirit eater that's slowly consuming you, chipping away at your soul, turning you into a monster, and that there are some very important players who are aware of this curse of yours and want to end you by any means? So the big evil players in Black Geyser are slowly spreading their corruption, turning man against his brother till man exists no more. In theory, that is, because the game fails spectacularly at making the world around you feel like it's caught up in a downward spiral of degradation and decay. Instead, it delivers this message through blasts of clumsy information dumps that totally pulverize any feeling of immersion that you might have had, and it turns your journey into a multi-step chore that has been broken up into milestones that must be conquered. In Black Geyser, you spend the entire time traveling to the next place where you'll meet the next exposition machine that'll tell you the next thing you need to know and so on and so forth. And to fill in the gaps, you'll always have this black-haired mysterious woman who has all the answers but only reveals them to you when the plot needs it. So this boring succession of meetups that's only very occasionally spiced up by a moderately unexpected event finally leads to the discovery of the bad guy's true identity and his motivations. And by that time, chances are you won't be giving two shits about anything. Some of you have said that Black Geyser should at least be given credit for building its own lore and not just copycatting something else. The thing is that it is copycatting something else. It's copycatting every piece of medieval fantasy lore that has ever existed and given it a different name. But whatever. Aside from some moderately interesting ethnic groups, the lore in this game is so generic and derivative that it really makes no difference if it's 100% original. Companions lore-wise. Like everything else that has to do with the writing in Black Geyser, they are generic and boring. I will say this though, none of them are irritating. They have some pretty decent motivations to tag along for the right for the most part, and some of them even intervene in helpful ways from time to time, giving relevant information or by simply being acknowledged by other NPCs as important people. Bajala Adelis knows important things about nobility and magic. Soraka is a Rillo pariah through which you get a pretty good idea of what the Rillo are like. But it feels as though the game doesn't give too much of a shit about these people, and as a result, neither did I. There isn't any funny or interesting party banter between them, it seems as though none of them are hiding any dirty little secrets, or at least none that interested me, none of them seem to have any personal stakes in the matter after their quests are done with, and it feels like the writers didn't even know where they wanted to go with some of them. Hamlin is a thief, but speaks like a noble and has extensive knowledge about art, why? During a fight he's always like, a beer would be nice. The dude's all over the place. There are some other potential companions like some dude named Arvex who's standing at the side of the road in one of the locations you visit. He says something about, about evil following in your wake or whatnot. Then there's a necromancer named Jade who seems to be a bit livelier than the rest of your companions but I didn't even take her along with me so I wouldn't know. And I didn't take her with me because I wasn't interested in meeting any more companions. That's how uninteresting companions are in Black Geyser. Companions gameplay wise. The problem that I found with all these would-be companions is that I already had a party of five when I met them, and it felt like it would have been a monumental pain in the ass to bring them along for the ride. Why? Well, in Dragon Age, for example, every companion you accept in your party immediately becomes available and illegible at your camp, and you can always access your camp easily. There are also plenty of pubs and other areas in which you can switch companions without having to go to a place to meet them again. In Black Geyser, you don't get the chance to ask your companions to just wait around for a while. If you ask them to leave the party for whatever reason, they will go pretty fucking far away most of the times. And when I say far away, I mean several loading screens away from where you're at. Also, companions in Dragon Age, for example, didn't have to be in your party to level, which probably didn't make too much sense story-wise, and it could be a little bit immersion-breaking at times, but it also meant that you could always ask any of them to come along without having to deal with them being severely underleveled. This is of course not the case with Black Geyser. Companions in Black Geyser are decent as combat buddies. It's not hard to put together a balanced party capable of taking on every combat encounter. You don't have too many options, but it's not like the game would play out too differently if you did. So I guess it's varied enough for what it is. As far as skill go, it's pretty obvious who's meant to be good at what. There's very little overlapping of skills and talents, and it's therefore easy to spread skills evenly so that you have everything covered. And you'd be wise to do so. One good thing that I can say about Black Geyser is that there are plenty of traps to disarm, locks to pick, people to convince, and potions to concoct. So with a little help from your friends, you'll be able to do all of that. 
There aren't any guild masters, trainers, rosters of freelancers at the local pub, nor any other means for you to create your own adventurers. And well, it seems like most other party-based isometric CRPGs have this feature nowadays. Pillars of Eternity, Divinity Original Sin 2, Pathfinder… So the fact that you can't create new adventurers on the fly in Black Geyser feels a bit like a missing feature. I think you can build a solid party that's capable of handling combat and non-combat situations at Black Geyser, but you're not exactly swimming in options here. Secondary mechanics and user experience. In addition to combat and questing, there's also trading, inventory management and crafting in Black Geyser, Couriers of Darkness. Playing the game in the hardest difficulty level will require you to at least pay some attention to your character's gear and your stock of potions and infusions, which will in turn add some weight to your exploration and resource gathering. Trading is straightforward and it uses some pretty useful filters and sorting criteria buttons. You can also switch characters on the fly with this combo box to have them take over the trading process. And if you're not a complete noob, you know that shift clicking allows you to choose more than one item to trade them all at once. Choosing the quantity of items you need is also very intuitive because there are little plus and minus arrows and a field of quantity. These are all very good examples of functions that you need to provide the user with when it comes to presenting data such as the items available for purchase or sale. But god damn it, you cannot compare items on the character's inventory to what another character is currently wearing from within the trading interface. Why? Also on your inventory screen, there is no way to compare a weapon to both your primary and your secondary weapons at once. And weapon switching does not work while you're on the inventory screen. You have to click on the weapon twice to grab it and drop it on the slot to have the character change weapons. Crafting is pretty straightforward and practical. When a companion learns a recipe, it immediately becomes available to every character in your party. And if you have the necessary ingredients to brew a potion, you'll see a little check mark next to the recipe and then a place items button. This makes things that should be easy, well, easy. User experience is a bit of a mixed bag though. Engaging in combat and using your skills is super intuitive and practical in Black Geyser. Also consider that you can engage anyone in combat in this game, but it is very unlikely that you'll do so by mistake. The fact that some characters will only attack you if you attack them first can also come in very handy, especially when you want to ambush them because you know there is no way to avoid a fight. But then there are some atrocious bits of user experience in this game. When you're waylaid by a group of enemies and must defend yourself, your party formation goes out the window. And as I have mentioned before, these random combat encounters happen all the freaking time. Also, this is a game that has some serious pathfinding issues, the kind you definitely shouldn't have in the year 2022. So secondary mechanics in Black Geyser are not great, not terrible. Sound effects and mix. Let's get this out of the way. This sound? It's nice. With you. The mighty four. And the animation that goes with it, with the screen stutter and all, this is the best motherfucking thing in the game. That little bit of lag after you pop the dude like an unwanted nasty sit. But the rest is a bit of a mixed bag. The Sonic landscape is fairly robust, although the main cities in the game could be a lot livelier and busier. Some combat sounds are pretty cool, while some are kinda lame. All of them are very well recorded, well mixed and consistent in tone and vibe. Here we go. Why not? Time to problem solve. Yes, I'll Compared to the sounds we got back in the day, sounds in Black Geyser are a blessing. I also like that there was a lot of attention to detail put into the sonic aspect of the user experience. There are lots of little sound cues for everything you do and that's always important. While not impressive, I think the sound in Black Geyser deserves a good score. Music. Hmm. Here we go again. What do you wish of me? What do you wish? Forgettable, that's what you are. 
I have no problem with the music taking a backseat and doing its job of immersion and ambiance, but this one is absolutely nothing special compared to any of its peers. And everything is relative, I suppose, so while I don't think it is as awful as some of you say it is, I think it's pretty dang forgettable. Voice acting. The reports I have read recommended you be elevated from the common rabble to the nobility. I intend to honor your birthright and make you the new head of the House of Espin. Quite a stroke of luck for you, I'd say. And everywhere you appear on my errands, your rotten, eyeless face will be the sigil of your failure. The King's voice is pretty decent, but aside from him, it's bad. And in most cases, it's not the actor's fault. Black Geyser is just another game that takes you for an idiot and spoon feeds you the story and everything you need to know about what's going on. And because their writing is shit, this happens through information dumps, plot convenient events, and on the nose expositions from the characters. And the voice acting here is 100% in tune with all of that, unfortunately. The game is only partially voiced, but I wish it hadn't been voiced at all. Graphics. Everyone seems to agree on this one, and I concur. Graphics are generic, but worst of all, artistically uninspired. Look at this market square, there are no dogs chasing kids, no people gossiping, no disarray whatsoever, or worn out tiles on the floor. Look at the outside of the church and the temple of elemental evil, which came out almost 20 years ago. Look at the market square in the Athlaka Bridge district in the city of Am in Baldur's Gate 2, or this market square in Divinity Original Sin 2. Graphics are not only about locations and building models of course, this department also includes character models, weapon items, animations, and the interface. And while none of that is terrible, it's not great either, aside from perhaps the interface. Some of the best items in the game look cool on your characters, and when you click on them to know more, some of them have cool little artwork. I like the fact that there are two different types of slings, and the first of all type in particular looks actually pretty cool on your character. Some enemies, especially near the end, have decent character models, and there are some neat animations, like the one I just told you about when you crit an enemy to hell and gone, or this spell or your character's animation when he uses the fusty ball to strike someone from a distance. The best aspect of the graphic package is without question the interface. It's consistent with the game's genre, its setting and tone. The choice of font was adequate and icons are clean and useful. Still, make no mistake about it, when compared to other games in its league, Black Geyser sits very near the bottom in the graphic department. Performance and stability. It isn't great. The game crashed a couple of times and it has way too many loading screens and they take way more than is acceptable nowadays. There are also some locations and many combat situations, especially near the end, in which the FPS drops so low that even I noticed. And if I noticed this, I can only imagine that Carrick from ACG must have had a field day with this one if he played it. On the performance and stability end of things, Black Geyser feels amateurish and unfinished. There's no way to candy coat it. Other considerations and final thoughts. Black Geyser is a hard pass if you ask me, guys. Its combat is bland and generic and it only gets good near the final stretch of the game. And it just takes too fucking long to get there. There are some decent fights and episodes here and there, but they are too few and too far apart. Its story is generic, but worst of all clunky and clumsily put together and not worth your time if you're a story guy. And in general, I think it's just too derivative of other better games and books. It brings nothing relevant to the game and the cool thing it tries to bring back, like putting the player in the driver's seat and making his or her decisions matter, lacks any sense of weight or reward and it's even poorly designed. I know that some of you may be doubtful about getting games that came out almost 20 years ago. But trust me, regardless of how poorly some of their user experience aspects and production values might have aged in some cases, they are all just light years better than this one. As for new games like the Pillars of Eternity series, Divinity Original Sin 2, Tyranny, Torment Tides of Numenera, hell even the ones that I didn't like like the Pathfinder games and even Siege of Dragonspear, they are all preferable to Black Geyser in my estimation. So this is the final score I'm giving it. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, thank you for watching all the way up until now. If you like what you're seeing in this channel, please consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell to avoid the usual YouTube shenanigans. Share the video, but most importantly, never stop gaming. But don't let gaming get in the way of your hopes and dreams. Bye, everyone.